so here we are in a lecture that's about Station Eleven, and I'm going to talk about Dracula. I want to start with Dracula because I've got this concept that I need to get across to y'all before we can we can move on. Uh, and and Dracula gives me one of the best examples of the thing that I'm talking about here. So we have um, two concepts, I guess you'd say. We've we've been talking about um, story and narrative. Right. So you can have the story of Noah's Ark and you have the narrative of, say, the Genesis account of Noah's Ark or the Darren Aronofsky film of Noah. Um, those are those are those are both narratives that are drawing from this larger story tradition. The story almost exists independent of the individual narratives. And some people would say, well, that's impossible. A story can't exist independent of those narratives. But like, I can think of lots of people who have never seen Star Wars or The Wizard of Oz who can tell me an awful lot about the story even if they've never experienced the particular narratives that deliver that story. And in digging a little deeper into narrative theory and how story elements are distinct from narrative elements, we want to talk about the difference between space and place. Place in narrative theory is an actual location, right? Uh, so I'm using the Borgo Pass from Bram Stoker's Dracula. And if you were to go on Google Map, you could look up the Borgo Pass and it's a real place. You would get a location. But the perception of that space in Dracula is radically distinct from what the actual Borgo Pass looks like. Now, this is because Bram Stoker, when he wrote Dracula, had never been to Transylvania. He never went to Transylvania. Had no idea what the place looked like. The actual Borgo Pass looks like it would be an awesome place to, if you were the kind of person who rode, you know, fast crotch rocket motorcycles, uh, to go up and down this really, really crazy hairpin turns um, and wonderful rolling hills. But in the photograph that I have off of the internet of the Borgo Pass, there's no sheer drop off, no crazy cliffs, and most importantly, no Dracula's castle. And that's the difference between place, which can be a real thing, and space, which is where a character is situated within a narrative. Now, I found this lovely painting, and I don't know who did it, but it's a it's a it's a gorgeous gorgeous painting of Dracula's castle, which incorporates the actual landscape of the Borgo Pass. Um, you can you can overlay this painting onto a photograph of the Borgo Pass, and they they map perfectly, except for the incredibly stark drop off in the presence of Dracula's ca castle and the fact that there's you know it's dark and gloomy and horrific. Um, but this is to illustrate that you can have, you know, even if the novel or movie or whatever it might be is representing the place, say like New York, if you film on location in New York, you're guaranteed to get it to look like New York. But the way that a character feels about New York in that particular movie or in that particular novel is going to change the way that it feels and craft it as a fictional space, okay? And, and so that's the difference between the place, which can exist, doesn't have to exist. You can have a, an imaginary place, but then again, that's going to be mediated or focalized to us through a character's perspective within what I would call the narrative frame. And so this consequently means that we need to be careful about making statements when we're we're doing some form of analysis of a narrative, making statements about what's happening, what's likely happening outside the frame. We don't know what's happening outside the frame of a novel. So someone, you know, might read Station Eleven and say, I've been to Toronto and it's just like that. I had a student years ago who said, I was in Toronto. Winters are like that. I could totally picture what Jeevan was going through in the theater. Cool. Someone who's actually been to Transylvania would say, I was in the Borgo Pass and it doesn't look anything like it does in Dracula and therefore Dracula's crap, 
You get a lot of that sort of thing. And I'm, you know, you might say, really, we do? Yeah, it's not always about what the location is like, but there are other aspects of what with what is within the narrative frame that people will pick apart because it doesn't perfectly mirror reality. Like guns don't sound like that. Um, cops don't really act like that. Forensic uh, medicine isn't done like that. Hackers don't do those things. There's a million versions of this that I have been front and center for. I, I've experienced it myself, you know. Um, profs aren't really like that. We don't, you know, when, when I when I see movies with professors in them and they've completely covered uh, a chalkboard, which is, you know, an anachronism at this point to some degree as well. It should be a whiteboard, but whiteboards don't look as cool. Um, it's not as cinematic. Blackboard totally looks cinematic and it's covered with all sorts of information, that they're not even lecturing on half the time. And I'm like, oh, that's so fakey. Um, yeah, that happens to me too. And, and what's happening there is that I'm pushing myself outside the frame. I'm no longer in what we call the fictional world, the fictional frame. Here's the fancy word for that, the diegesis of the narrative. I'm, I'm now outside of that. And we need to be focused inside the frame. We need to be focused in the space in which the character is situated. I'm going to tell you a story that, that might illustrate this uh, a little bit better. Uh, there was a Christmas this one year. Um, I probably should have included the photo in the uh, in the slideshow, but that would have been useless for you know all the people listening to this as a podcast. But there was a Christmas years ago, um, and uh, I was visiting my sister and her family, and we were about to take a family photo of just my wife and our kids. And I had our son, and I was walking towards where we were going to take this photo, and I slammed my toe into my sister's couch, which near as I can tell was made from the heart of a dark star because it had the same level of density to it. It did not move at all when my toe slammed into it. So my middle toe made this sound and then there was this sudden sense of bright pain, bright white pain lancing up through my leg and I thought I've broken my toe. Now I start making faces because I'm in pain. My wife thinks I'm goofing off because I'm making my nieces laugh. And she says, get over here and get in this photo. And my father is just trying to get the shot lined up and he starts snapping. Just taking photo after photo after photo. And I'm trying to get my pain under control long enough to just smile. Now, there is a family photo that's resulted from this where I am absolutely smiling. As far as the frame is concerned, that was a very, very happy moment. Now, if I asked you to study that particular photo, you wouldn't have any idea of what happened outside the frame. We start extrapolating even when we don't know what happened outside the frame. We start to think, oh, I know what was going on there. Uh, we, we extrapolate. If a movie ends in, in an in incomplete or unresolved way, like, um, uh, you know, the movie Inception ends with an uncertain uh, last shot, we... As pattern recognition animals try to fill in the gaps. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with any of these things. These sorts of speculations, what happens outside the frame, discussions that, hey, the Borgo Pass doesn't really look like it does in Dracula, in real life. These are all fine. There's nothing wrong with doing these things. But when we are analyzing literature, we need to remember that space, the narrative element, is place, a story element, experienced by a character. And again, those places don't always have to be real. The Emerald City of the Wizard of Oz has been imagined many times over by artists, production designers for film and for stage, and it changes from iteration to iteration. There is no actual place that we would call the Emerald City, and yet we reference it, and then someone crafts an initial, or sorry, not an initial, but they craft a iteration of that particular place and it becomes narrative space. And it can feel different from film to film, from play to play, from image to image. Dracula's castle is almost always ominous, but you know, if it was rendered say in Hotel Transylvania or something like that, then it loses that same sense of dread that it has for the character of Jonathan Harker at the beginning of Stoker's novel. So I like that as an example because the, the real Borgo Pass doesn't look like the Borgo Pass in Stoker's novel. Nevertheless, it doesn't change that in 
Stoker's novel, there is a castle and there is a sheer drop off in the Borgo Pass. Still a really cool place to go and, you know, take your crotch rocket motorcycle if you like thrills like that. But not the actual Borgo Pass. And that's okay. Within the fiction, that's how the Borgo Pass looks. Likewise, bringing it back to Station Eleven. We're going into the section of Midsummer Night's Dream. We've moved out of the theater, but I want to just go back to the theater for a moment. Uh, you know, imagine Toronto or New York as it is, you know, or was, we could say even was, because as I'm delivering this, this is under, uh, you know, COVID and, and New York probably doesn't look quite the same as it, it did prior. You know, there's not a bunch of people down in Times Square in the same way that there was when I visited there in 2017. But we have the New York of the real world place. And we have the New York, say, of the movie I Am Legend with Will Smith. That's a space. That's a narrative space. Even filming on location, that's still a fictional space. It doesn't really exist. It is a narrative space focalized. Let's never forget that we you know, focalized through the point of view of a character. And it's more, so we, we talk about setting in uh, high school English. It's often just the place and the time. But setting is so much more than that. It's how the novel, the book, the short story, the characters feel about that place. So New York can be really awesome in a rom-com. A beautiful place of magic and wonder might be a place of, of darkness and dread in a post-apocalyptic narrative. Something like I Am Legend, Escape from New York. And we get this area near Lake Michigan in Station Eleven. Lake Michigan's a real place. St. Deborah on the Water is not. And somebody could say, well, there's no such place as St. Deborah on the Water. There is in Station Eleven. In the diegesis of that novel, there is. Now, I can already hear somebody going, well, well, maybe they just named it that after the apocalypse. It doesn't matter. It could have been there for a hundred years. The imaginary towns exist in imaginary tales. Uh, we can have cities that don't actually exist. Metropolis, Gotham City, from, you know, DC Comics, Superman and Batman, respectively. What am I getting at here? Where am I going with this? Well, you can really go to Lake Michigan and you can really see it. But it wouldn't change that it's not the Lake Michigan from Station Eleven. And you're like, well, of course it's not because that's, that's not real. Yeah, but at the same time, readers respond to narratives frequently as though they are real. As though they are the thing itself. I'll, I'll explain more, but I want to quote Alfred Korsbiski here. Alfred Korsbiski was a Polish engineer, mathematician, and a philosopher. He was a scholar. And uh, one of his ideas was the map is not the territory. It's one of my favorite ideas. It's one of my favorite ways to conceptualize fiction in any of its forms. The map is not the territory, said Korsbiski. The word is not the thing it describes. You think about the word tree, tree in English, baum in German, arbor, or something like that in French. I'm terrible with my French. I can't say that word. I cannot say tree in French. But we have these other words, and do they sound like tree? Is there, a, is there a, an essential treeness to the word tree? The map is not the territory. The word is not the thing it describes. Whenever the map is confused with the territory, a semantic disturbance is set up in the organism. The disturbance continues until the limitation of the map is recognized. We must recognize the limitation of the map. The map is not the territory. The word is not the thing it describes. The representation is not the reality. That's another way of saying this. The representation is not the reality. So there is a real Lake Michigan place. There's no such place in our 
ex- experience as St. Deborah in the, on the water. But it is, it does exist as a narrative space in Station Eleven. And that narrative space is the one that appears on the front cover of that uh, special edition of Subterranean Press's uh, version of Station Eleven. This is St. Deborah on the Water. This is the Traveling Symphony sneaking away. And you might be like, well, isn't this just all a fancy way of saying that stories are made up? Absolutely. Absolutely. We know they're made up. And yet, I frequently have students uh, having problems with any number of narratives staying inside the frame, staying inside the narrative frame. So I get some form of the guns don't really sound that way um, in analysis from my students. So there's a short story called um, Yellow Wallpaper and by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. And the husband in the story is not a good guy. I don't know if I'd want to go so far as saying he's the villain, but he's not a good guy. He's kind of, he's kind of keeping his wife trapped in a room. And I've had students write me essays where they say, well, maybe John is actually a good guy. And I'm like, not as far as the text is concerned. And they're like, yes, but, but maybe she's just telling us what she thinks about John and can we really trust her? And I'm like, she's the author. She's the only lens you have to understand this fictional character. There is no John outside the text, outside the frame, outside the map. John is not a good guy because Charlotte Perkins Gilman's yellow wallpaper is trying to argue that women were trapped in the society, the patriarchal society that that Perkins Gilman wrote in. And the whole narrative of the yellow wallpaper is about that. So arguing that John might really be a good guy is pointless because he doesn't really exist. It's a little bit like the arguments that came out after the Superman movie uh, Man of Steel, which ends with Superman killing someone. People are like, Superman wouldn't kill someone. I, I'm like, he did in that movie. And they're like, yes, but he wouldn't. I'm like, you don't go for coffee with Superman. He's not a real person. And, and, and you know, someone might say, well, there's a precedent for that. In Superman 2, he killed some people at the end of the... I don't care. In that particular map, in that particular representation of the story cycle of Superman, Superman killed someone. Now analyze the film. Don't give me this, it wasn't what I wanted it to be, or my char- my favorite character wouldn't do that. They did in this particular case. And it's, 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 it's similar to the conversations that you can have where someone says, well, they wouldn't be able to do that. They did, though. They did. Within the diegesis, the narrative world, it happened. Now analyze that thing. Not the book you didn't read, not the film you didn't see, but the one you did read and the one you did see. And... I've learned this firsthand. I was, I was in a, in a uh, class in grad school and I was talking about how I thought the novel should have ended. And my prof listened very patiently. And when I was done, he said, Mike, thank you very much for that uh, really interesting uh, analysis of how the book should have ended. But um, if we could maybe just turn back to analyzing the book we actually read. And I, I was chastised. It was, it was a good chastisement. It was something that I needed to hear because what I was doing is this thing that we often do in society. We got all these YouTube videos, like how the movie should have ended or what you think should have happened. That's not the text. So if you're going to do analysis for a literature course, if you're going to do analysis, really even in, in any respect, it can't, it can't be this game of what it ought to have been because that's not what it is. You can't analyze a thing that isn't. So we stick within the map itself and we recognize that it is not reality. And so we say, well, of course, I knew this was fiction. It's, it's about the future. How could it not? Trust me, people get these things confused frequently. 
they start thinking about their own experiences. They start thinking about how that character is kind of like their aunt or their dad or somebody they know. And we, 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 we develop these attachments. And what that does is it impedes our ability to really read the text fully. Give you an example of this. And, you know, this is, this is something that, that, that has happened a few times with, with Station Eleven. Somebody says um, the plague wouldn't have moved that fast. So there were epidemiologists who looked at Station Eleven because, you know, it won the Arthur C. Clarke Award and therefore now it's science fiction. So science fiction fans were like, the, the plague was fakey. Would society really have developed in that way? Um, you know, more recently, one of my students said, where are the engineers? And it's like, I don't know, maybe they're out there. Maybe there are engineers somewhere on the planet. Maybe somewhere else. You know, there's a, there's a complaint that we're going to hear from an academic source later in the semester where, you know, she doesn't like that it's a focus on that dead white guy Shakespeare. Where's the, you know, the other um, types of art? And it's like, maybe they're out there. Maybe somewhere... In the world of Station Eleven, there's an acapella group. Maybe there are some, you know, freestyle rap artists entertaining people on one of the other Great Lakes. But Emily St. John Mandel, like any novelist, like any storyteller, has a focus. She is telling a particular narrative. It, it doesn't have to cohere perfectly with reality at any level. The fact that we love Mickey Mouse is proof that we really don't need this to cohere with reality. Because real mice get chased with a broom. Mickey Mouse, you know, that's a, that's a, that's, that's a world away in terms of representation. Very different map. And, and when we take this idea of the map and the territory, we have to remember that different maps have different purposes. Different representations have different purposes. So this is, this is in some ways similar to the idea of story and narrative. You're going to have the story of an apocalypse and someone can say, well, this apocalypse feels kind of fakey because like, really, would they be doing Shakespeare? They are. That's the thing. In Station Eleven, they're doing Shakespeare. And that is what we have to analyze. So we understand the map is not the territory. The representation is not the thing. And that can help us a little bit when we start to, to dig in with the ideas, you know, that this, is, this book is a work of science fiction. Somebody wants it to cohere with a particular vision of science fiction, and it might not. Uh, I want to give you, uh, I want to introduce you to a um, wonderful online source called the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction. It's edited, curated by the um, incomparable John Clute, who has made this really a life's work. This is legacy for John Clute. Um, and uh, you, you, there isn't really an entry on, on apocalyptic, but there is on disaster. Central to the, the disaster tradition, says the entry, uh, of the Encyclop Encyclopedia of Science Fiction. Again, this is online. You just Google Encyclopedia of Science Fiction and you're going to find this. And it's a wonderful resource uh, for learning more about the genre of science fiction. Central to the disaster tradition are stories of vast biospheric changes which drastically affect human life. Disaster stories appeal because they represent everything we most fear and at the same time perhaps secretly desire. A depopulated world, escape from the constraints of a highly organized industrial society, the opportunity to prove one's ability as a survivor. Okay, so a depopulated world, yeah we get that in Station Eleven, Escape from the constraints of a highly organized industrial society. Yeah, we've lost the constraints for sure. The opportunity to prove one's ability as a survivor. Urch. If we can make that sound in a car uh, pulled by horses. That doesn't cohere, right? So that's different. Emily St. John Mandel's vision of the, you know, the, the disaster tradition with the vast biospheric changes which drastically affect human life, in this case a plague, um, first two aspects of that yes last one no uh, and so this map is different from other apocalyptic ma maps different from other post-apocalyptic maps and we want to identify its difference 
and then analyze it for what it is, not for what it isn't. We want to identify what kind of map is this? What kind of representation is this? Well, we've got that repetition of this theme, um, this sign that's on the, uh, the traveling symphony's um, caravan. Because survival is insufficient, which we find out later is a, a quotation from uh, Star Trek. Because survival is insufficient. I got this image from, uh, there's an image for those of you who are uh, on, the, on the podcast and just listening to this um, off of a playlist. And I, I can't even remember anymore, you know, <laughs> what point in streaming services this was. Uh, but it says a dystopian society remix. And there is an image, it's a wonderfully drawn image of the traveling symphony from Station Eleven. And I'm, I'm using it here because I, you know, remember we've got Patrick DeWitt, author of The Sisters Brothers, saying in the blurb on the book that this book is dystopian. That there is a dystopic element to it. Actually, he just flat out says it's dystopian. He doesn't say it's a dystopic element. Uh, but let's find out what the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction says about dystopia. The word dystopia is the commonly used antonym of utopia and denotes that class of hypothetical societies containing images of worlds worse than our own. Dystopian images are almost invariably images of a future society pointing fearfully at the way the world is supposedly going in order to provide urgent propaganda for a change in direction. Okay, well, let's see how that measures up against Station Eleven. Worlds worse than our own. Well, it, it is in the sense that, you know, most everybody's died. But does Emily St. John Mandel really describe the world of A Midsummer Night's Dream, this, future, this 20 years jump into the future, in ways that are worse than our own? Certainly, we've got the introduction of the prophet, um, this cult figure who leads this community in St. Deborah by the Water. But is all of this... A dystopic world in the same way that we find in other dystopic works? Is this a Hunger Games world that Kirsten and the Traveling Symphony occupy? Or do we have passages where Emily St. John Mandel is highlighting the beauty of this, this future? There are several points in A Midsummer Night's Dream where Emily St. John Mandel is using the same kind of language that she was using at the very end of the theater to talk about the beauty of of this world that, that, you know, yeah, at the story level is worse than our own. But narratively, narratively, is Mandel representing it that way? Dystopian images, says the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction, are almost invariably images of future society. Check, 20 years into the future, pointing fearfully at the way the world is supposedly going. Is that what we're getting with Station Eleven? We didn't get, we didn't get the same level of fear in the theater that we got in Contagion, do we, do we have a, a, a similar level of fear to other dystopic works? Or is Station Eleven distinct in this fashion once again? Is Station Eleven providing urgent propaganda for a change in direction? Is there some way we can avoid this awful future? Probably not. Because Mandel's novel isn't a how to avoid the flu novel. It's not like Doomsday Book by Connie Willis. And even that book isn't really, at the end of the day, how to get through a pandemic. So, again, we may come to a text and we may say, okay, these story elements are, uh, feel dystopic or the world of the future is worse than our own because there's guys like the prophet. But how does Mandel me mediate that world through her word choice? Because that's what novels have. Films have visuals and sound and all sorts of other, you know, film language. Novels have words. And they have patterns that emerge from the, the way that those words are placed together. We get this repetition of, of survival being insufficient. First time that I read Station Eleven, I was convinced that Emily St. John Mandel was riffing off of a post-apocalyptic film and book. There's a, uh, there, there's a book as well. Uh, but I was thinking particularly about the film with Kevin Costner, The Postman. 
in which he plays this guy who goes from town to town performing Shakespeare in front of a post-apocalyptic audience. There's like there's an element with him watching uh, TV that isn't on. He's got a TV guide open, and that makes me think of August and his love of TV guide. Uh, there's a scene with a deer that mirrors the, you know, the use of a deer in Station Eleven. There is a sort of crazed cult leader who, you know, chases the postman for most of the film. There's a scene at one point where they're watching all these 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 guys who are followers of this of this warlike cult figure are watching the Sound of Music. And and the, and something happens with the projector, and the guy changes the movie over to Universal Soldier, this this B action movie. Uh, and so we move from the hills are alive to machine gun fire, and and as soon as the the film changes to something violent, you think that all these mercenaries would be totally on board with watching Dolph Lundgren shoot people to death. Nope, they get really really angry. They start throwing rocks at the projection booth. They want, they want Julie Andrews back. They want the sound of music. And I felt like there was so much intertextuality going on that, that Emily St. John Mandel absolutely had to have seen The Postman. When she visited McEwen when uh, Station Eleven was our book of the year, I said, so, The Postman. And I told my students, I was like, ah, I'm positive Emily St. John Mandel has seen this movie. She's like, I have never seen that movie, but now I really want to. And I was like, whoop. But... I frequently have seen, you know, because we've we've had authors in year after year at McEwen. And my students will say, this is what I think your book is about. And they go, no, but that's super cool that you you went that route. Like um, Patrick DeWitt, author of Sisters Brothers. (laughs) My students were writing about Sisters Brothers and he had come to visit and here he was in my class. And... My students would say, I think Sisters Brothers is about. And Patrick DeWitt would go, no, no, but that's really cool. And, and there's this sense of graciousness on the part of those authors to say, like, I think it's really neat that you're an analyzing this text in this way. Um, but no, that wasn't what I intended at all. But they think it's really cool how these elements come together. And again, this is perhaps uh, an example of how intertextuality works. The multiple ways in which any one literary text is, in fact, made up of other texts. Maps made up of other maps. Representations made up of other representations. By means of its unavoidable participation, unavoidable participation in the common stock of linguistic and literary conventions and procedures. Maybe there's just something quintessentially post-apocalyptic about going from town to town and performing Shakespeare. And David Brin, the writer of the novel Post The Postman, and then the film version of, you know, The Postman, and now Station Eleven, they're all doing this. Maybe it's just something that, that comes up again and again. A common stock, right? Linguistic and literary conventions and procedures that are always already in place and constitute the discourses into which we are born. The The novel overtly references... Uh, a Midsummer Night's Dream in this section, not only through the title, but the performance, the, the, the traveling symphony performing A Midsummer Night's Dream. And if you're like, wait a second, what has this got to do with the map is not the territory? We're going to come back around to it, so hang in there. Um, in the first section of Station Eleven, the, the Shakespeare performance is King Lear, which is a tragedy. And Lear goes from very put together regal king to madman in the forest look at the description of kirsten and her costume near the beginning of uh midsummer night's dream where the traveling symphony is performing lear and we we get an echo of that the the very scenes that they are describing there seem to me to be that before and after vision that lear mirrors again Asked Emily St. John Mandel about this. She was like, no, no, I wasn't really going for that. But it's, she was like, that's really cool. It's almost like an unconscious thing that some authors do potentially. But we can read stuff into a text if, as long as it's on the page and we can point to it and say, but there it is. There's that thing. Shakespeare is in Station Eleven, first with Lear, then with Midsummer Night's Dream. 
Midsummer Night's Dream is not a tragedy, it's a comedy. And Philip Smith, in an article called Shakespeare's Survival and the Seeds of Civilization and Emily St. John Mandel, Station 11, which was one of the first articles written by an academic about Station 11. It's all about Shakespeare. But he says, significantly, however, the play, A Midsummer Night's Dream, is a story of recovery and even apocalypse averted. It is not a play about the end, but about revival. So he's, he's like, this, this play somehow symbolizes some of the other things that, that Station Eleven is about. And if the wedding thesis is true, new beginnings, the players of the traveling symphony in Station Eleven decide against performing Shakespeare's two most apocalyptic plays because, the Lear and Hamlet, because in a post-apocalyptic setting, they are too depressing. Before the apocalypse, tragedy's cool. Or maybe tragedy mirrors tragedy in the theater. But now... We're in the post-apocalypse, and the night calls for fairies, as the text says, as the book says. They choose a Midsummer Night's Dream because in a time when the apocalypse is very much apparent, the staging of revival does not simply act as a form of escapism, but as a catalyst for recovery. But a catalyst for recovery. Uh, Philip Smith, like many academics, makes far more of Shakespeare in Station Eleven than I think he or anyone else needs to. When, uh, when Station Eleven was Book of the Year, I was on a panel with some of my colleagues, and one of my colleagues was making a great deal about the Shakespeare in the play, or in the, in the novel. And I was like, it, it, it doesn't take up that much space. They, I mean, there are references to it, but it's not over and over again, and at some point it, it gets abandoned. What, what's amazing to me is that Calvin and Hobbes comes up at one point. Comics, comes, comics come up over and over and over again, but I have yet to see any academic work really done on the comics references in, in, uh, in Station Eleven. Tons about Shakespeare. A little, uh, little about the comics, but... What Philip Smith says here is at least something that I can look at and I can go, okay, that resonates with what I'm seeing in this book. But again, I'm looking just at the map, not what I want Station Eleven to be about, but what it is ultimately about. What is Station Eleven about? Well, Maximilian Feldner knows, right? Survival is insufficient. The post-apocalyptic imagination of Emily St. John Mandel's Station Eleven says, Since Station Eleven's post-apocalyptic scenario is not determined by the brutal rule of a state of nature, and its characters do not have to concentrate on survival, so in other words, because Station Eleven's future is not The Road, The Walking Dead, or Mad Max... The characters within the, nar the narrative have the opportunity to engage in cultural activities. These other narratives highlight struggle and conflict. They highlight struggle and conflict. St. John Mandel's novel has humanity arguably redeeming itself through culture. Survival is insufficient. Culture, art, creativity. Why aren't we getting this act? Like, why aren't we seeing the engineers? Why aren't we seeing the scientists? Why aren't we seeing the epidemiologists? Because this novel isn't about them. There are novels that are. It's a wonderful, uh, several wonderful Im imaginings of the end of the world that involve those sorts of, of, of points of view. I mean, Contagion had all the epidemiologists and all the people working uh, to, to stop the spread of, uh, of the contagion. Um, there's a really, really cool, and I can't remember the title of it right now, but there's a really cool Kevin Anderson novel where, uh, there is a, an, an agent that gets introduced into San Francisco Bay that can eat plastic, that can eat, um, oil-based products. And it chews up, like it basically eats CDs, most of your house. You think of the number of things that are made from plastic in our world. Well, you better believe there are scientists involved in that particular narrative. Because that's a different, it's just a different approach to science fiction. Consider who our focalizer is. Consider who is the person by which we understand the narrative space. Not what would really be going on during this time. Because you get into these conversations. And it's fine to do that. There's nothing wrong with it. But if we're going to analyze the text as text, then we have to say, okay, Emily St. John Mandel's clearly not interested in some of the same things that I would be if I was telling a end-of-the-world narrative. 
because she has for her vocalizer the character of Kirsten, who is what? Well, she's going to be played by Mackenzie Davis, who was in the last Terminator movie, among other films. Um, Mackenzie Davis is going to be Kirsten in the HBO Max film. And if you take a look at some of the photos from the Terminator movie, she looks pretty badass. She looks like the kind of person who could be like Kirsten because Kirsten has some knife tattoos. And at this point in the nar narrative, we're not 100% sure what those mean, but we can tell that she's capable and she survived. I mean, she was just a little girl in the theater and now she's all grown up and she survived the apocalypse. What has she seen? She's an actor. I'm not talking about Mackenzie Davis anymore. I'm talking about Kirsten is an actor. Mackenzie Davis will be an actor playing an actor when she plays Kirsten in the HBO Max version of Station Eleven. Who is focalizing the action? The narrative space of Station Eleven. An actor. What does that tell us? That Emily St. John Mandel is not interested in the same things that Kevin J. Anderson is. That other writers, other filmmakers people who are crafting narratives about the apocalypse are. She is not Cormac McCarthy. She is not uh, uh, Kirkman, the guy who did uh, Walking Dead as a comic book. She's, she's not any of those people. She's Mandel. She's Emily St. John Mandel. And her book is not about the same kind of apocalypse that these other narratives are about. That's Feldner's thesis in a nutshell. So when we're trying to understand this novel, we certainly compare and contrast it with other post-apocalyptic narratives, but we can't drop our brain so far into the diegesis that we sit there going, wait a second, if this actually happened, wouldn't blank? Maybe, and maybe it did in Emily St. John Mandel's brain, and she just didn't put it on the page. We, as students of a text, be it uh, be, be it uh, a written book or a film or a game, need to analyze the work for what it is, not for what it isn't, for what it is. And we can, we can do that sort of through that, that lens of what it is. And if we say, okay, I recognize that this doesn't have any of the things that I think should actually be there for a post-apocalyptic narrative. That's different from what I expected. I wonder what she's up to. That's, that's the progression. That's the direction that we want to take that. Because unless we're bankrolling this stuff, it's never going to be exactly what we expect. Now let's bring it into, to talk about comparison and contrast, let's bring it into conversation with Walter Van Tilburg Clark's short story, The Portable Phonograph. You read that over and take a look at just the first page of narrative and the words that Walter Van Tilburg Clark chooses. Oh, what a dismal future. So ask yourself the question, what effect does this story produce? It's bleak. This story seems to be working in the same universe as Cormac McCarthy's The Road. It's that bleak. Is there at any point some aha moment? Because this is something that, uh, happens in short stories. Not only do we have the single effect that we talked about last week with Poe, but we also have this concept that uh, supposedly originates with James Joyce, James Joyce um, of the epiphany, where someone in the text goes, aha, or we as the reader read something in the text that makes us go, aha, right? And we know something potentially maybe that the characters don't. Now, this is this is a this is another narrative wherein you could say survival is insufficient. But it's different from Station 11. In both Station 11 and the Portable Phonograph, we have the preservation of culture, the preservation of art. But when we look at these narratives next to each other, we want to ask the, the what, what difference does the difference make? Emily St. John Mandel's future is really quite beautiful by comparison to Walter Van Tilburg Clark's The Portable Phonograph. Take a look again at the word choices that Walter Van Tilburg Clark uses in just the opening section. And it, as I say, it's just so god-awful bleak. And yet, 
people reading this, a- academics reading this book or this short story, uh, have all sorts of readings that I don't really think cohere with what the what the narrative is about. So novel guide says the greed that the doctor sees in the others. So those of you who haven't read um, the Ford- portable phonograph just need to know uh, there's this character, the doctor, who has a portable phonograph, a crank, hand-cranked uh, record player, and he plays records. Jazz, in this particular um, story, he's playing uh, some classical music. After he has read to a group who comes by his little hovel, his little cave, in a post-apocalypse, they're gathering together, not around the warmth of a fire so much as the warmth of cultural memory. And there is this desire in the listeners for the music, for the narratives that the, that, that the doctor speaks and plays. And Novel Guide says, the greed that the doctor sees in the others is a reflection of the feelings and thoughts that he himself has. And when I look at that text, when I read that text from start to finish, I don't see any of that. His, his views are distorted and he sees himself in the men. Read the portable phonograph and tell me, where is that? Where is that in the text? Novel guide. Where? What words does Walter Van Tilburg Clark use to give us this, this idea of greed? What map were you looking at? He invites them back every week, it seems, so it is quite possible that his possessions do not make him as happy as the company he receives every week. This is pure conjecture. It's not based in the text. It's based in the gaps in the text, the things that the text didn't say. And that is, that's not scholarship. That's right in your own damn book, right in your own story. That's creative. This is creative writing. This isn't scholarship. The contrast between the happiness that the men get from his musical device and the lack of fulfillment this provides for him is interesting. I don't get it because I don't really think that that's what the doctor feels is I don't read anything in Walter Van Tilburg's the portable Van Tilburg Clark's the portable phonograph that talks about greed in that way now you might come back at me and you say well you know everybody's got their own opinion about what a story can mean if it's not based on the text I don't care if it's not based in the images of the film I don't care if it's based in the gaps if it's based in pure conjecture it's creative writing. And that's not to diss creative writing, by the way. In fact, I should come up with another term for it because, well, it's bullshit is what it is. Master Plots 2 short story series. By the way, my students, don't use master plots on your papers. There is a deliberate indeterminacy as to what human nature may be and how it relates to its own achievements in this story. For example, technology, which has been created by humans, has destroyed itself and so destroyed humans. The short story doesn't really say how the world came to an end. But Master Plots has decided that it must have had something to do with technology. Uh, it's, it's, it's unclear. It's, ambi- it's ambivalent. Um, has destroyed itself and so destroyed humans. Or perhaps human beings, having made technology, have misused it and destroyed themselves. Only in a civilized world is there technology. And technology is control over, sometimes destruction of, nature. The portable phonograph is about a guy playing records and reading stories to other guys in a cave in the post-apocalypse. Master Plots is like, let's talk about technology because that's what I wanted to talk about. It's not what the short story is about. The short story is not about technology. Absolutely, the phonograph itself is a form of technology, but that's not really what the map is doing. It's not what the representation is focused on. Master Plots 2 also suggests maybe it, maybe this short story is about murder. The end of the story disturbingly suggests that the young musician, no doubt dying from his disease, may nevertheless be capable of killing Jenkins in order to acquire the phonograph and the record. Suddenly there's this conspiracy theory of murder. Now, absolutely, the, the short story ends with a sense that um, the doctor must protect the books that he's read and the records that he's played with a weapon. 100%. I'm there. He may kill not for power, but for the temporary possession of a certain kind of beauty. Well, it's that certain kind of beauty that's the focus of Walter Van Tilburg Clark's The Portable Phonograph. In fact, I think that 
Walter Van Tilburg Clark crafted his story so bleakly at the beginning to highlight the beauty of the art that survives through the through the records and uh, and the books. Edward H. Cohen in Explicator, which, by the way, is an article that you could you could use if you were going to write about an article or a, a, an essay about the portable phonograph. But the whole article is questioning which WC song, which nocturne is is being played. Which piece of classical music? Walter Van Tilburg Clark didn't include the title. It probably doesn't matter. And this kind of scholarship is why I talk about the map not being the territory, because so often I see people focusing on some minutiae and going, let's just milk everything we can out of this. Overfocus on the meaning of Shakespeare in Station Eleven might make you miss that the presence of Shakespeare in Station Eleven is the presence of one more form of art. Over and over again, Station Eleven is about art. When Kirsten's walking around St. Deborah by the water and she sees these, these symbols on, on the doors and she's not quite sure what it means, she also sees that this door that has been, you know, put on front of the Wendy's has had flowers carved into it. It's an interesting detail. It's an interesting detail. It doesn't have deeper meaning. I don't think, I don't think it's like, well, what do the, what do the flowers mean in that particular scene? What are the flowers? Their craftsmanship, their artwork, there's someone in the apocalypse crafting something beautiful. And that is a repetition in Station Eleven. Shakespeare, it's going to get left behind at some point. We're not going to be dealing with Shakespeare anymore. Not, not, not extensively after we're done with A Midsummer Night's Dream. Now, granted, you, you, you title an entire section A Midsummer Night's Dream, and yeah, Shakespeare matters in understanding Station Eleven, but I don't think in a way that means that like we have to go and find out, well, what's the deep significance of the inclusion of King Lear in Midsummer Night's Dream? We can just say, well, one's a tragedy, and the other one's a comedy, and before the apocalypse, tragedy's cool, and after the apocalypse, tragedy's not cool. But more importantly, the theme of survival is insufficient is supported by Mandel's focus and on a character who focalizes theater, a traveling symphony that plays jazz and some classical and redone versions of popular songs and performs Shakespeare, is art. It is an example of survival being insufficient that it's not enough to just stay alive, but that life somehow needs something more. Critical Survey of Short Fiction says this about the portable phonograph. The books that the doctor have saved, has saved symbolize the beauty of man's artistic creativity as opposed to the destructiveness of his mechanical creativity. Man's drive for mechanical accomplishment, the same drive that has destroyed a world, now has also preserved the beauty of his musical accomplishment. Well, that's still focusing a bit more on that technology side than I think that Walter Van Tilburg Clark's book or short story really does. But at the very least, it's recognizing that the short story is about the preservation of art after a catastrophe um, that has destroyed the world as it was. The preservation of art, survival is insufficient. That is what the map of Station Eleven is concerned with. So while we might look at the territory of the real world and say, hey, wouldn't there be X, Y, and Z? Not if Emily just St. John Mandel wants to be focused on A, B, and C. We focus on what her fiction is writing about because fiction is always focused on something and things will always get left out on the margins. Mandel's writing about art in a post-apocalypse, the preservation of culture within that. And next week, what we're going to find is that we're going to jump backwards in time. We won't even be in the post-apocalypse anymore, but we'll absolutely still be talking about how survival is insufficient. I'll see you then.